In John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What does it look like to believe this? Both individually and as a church, what does it look like for us to believe that apart from him, we can do nothing? Writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Again, what does it look like to believe this? As you consider the difficulties that you face in this broken world, and as you reflect on your personal need to to grow spiritually in order to face those challenges, as you reflect on your desire for this church to grow in our impact upon this world, what does it look like to believe that it is only God who gives that growth? I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verse 6. You can find it on page 118 in the second half of the Pew Bible. Jesus Christ had just risen from the grave and had just spent 40 more days on the earth, further teaching his disciples, bringing us to Acts chapter 1, verse 6. We'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Hear the word of the Lord to you. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word to us. By the Holy Spirit, apply your word to our hearts that we might recognize our utter dependence upon you for spiritual growth, for fruit in ministry, that we might devote ourselves to prayer. Bless the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the 11 remaining disciples are called out by name in verse 13, but it's not just them who are gathered here. As verse 14 notes, they were gathered together with the women. Well, who were they? Well, from Luke 23, we know that some number of women had come with Jesus and the apostles from Galilee to Jerusalem. These women were there with Jesus when his lifeless body was laid in the tomb on the evening of Good Friday. It was these women who were first discovered, who first discovered the empty tomb. Several, though not all of them, are named in Luke 24, verse 10. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and then it says others. And then here in the upper room in Acts chapter 1, we see that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers were there as well, likely referring to the younger brothers and sisters of Jesus that were born to Mary following the virgin conception and birth of Jesus. We read about them in Matthew 13. Some of them are named. And this reference to his brothers might, might also be referring not just to his siblings, but also to all the other disciples as well given that the next verse, verse 15, speaks of there being in all about 120 people there in Jerusalem following Jesus. As these very first Christians gathered together, what are they doing? They're praying. It doesn't say exactly what they're praying for, just that with one accord they were devoting themselves to prayer. Or as the NIV renders it, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Prayer. 
That's what marks their lives, fervent, continual prayer. Now, in the context, one of the things they were surely praying for as they gathered together was for God the Father and God the Son to send God the Spirit upon them, as Jesus had promised, both in the Gospel of John repeatedly and then here at the beginning of Acts. But why? Why why would they have so desired the gift of the Holy Spirit that they would devote themselves continually to prayer until they received that gift? Well, for, for one, Jesus had just left the earth. He wouldn't be returning anytime soon. So, so they were longing for God's presence with them once again. So they prayed for the Holy Spirit. But, but it's more than that. They longed for the gift of the Holy Spirit because they recognized their desperate need for the power the Spirit would grant them to accomplish the mission that Jesus had given to his followers. As Jesus explained in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. To be his witness is to fulfill the charge to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, Matthew 28. But they can't fulfill that charge. They can't fulfill the charge to go and make disciples without the work of the Spirit in them. And so they remained there in Jerusalem for ten days, devoting themselves to prayer until the day of Pentecost arrives. The Spirit comes upon them, and they all begin to publicly proclaim the mighty works of God. Peter stands up to explain what has just happened to to those who are confused and looking on. He concludes his sermon with these words in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Christ both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. With many other words he bore witness, and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. There were added that day about three thousand souls. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So having now received the gift of the Holy Spirit, what are they doing now? Well, they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, now available to us in the form of the New Testament. And thus we too devote ourselves to studying all that God has spoken through his prophets. They are devoting themselves to the fellowship to everything associated with partnering together as a church, helping one another to to worship God, helping one another to to grow in Christ-likeness, to bear one another's burdens, and to spread the gospel. This includes the breaking of bread, it says. Now, there's an argument to be made that this phrase, the breaking of bread, is, is meant to refer to the celebration of the Lord's table, as we do each week. Certainly, that's a very important part of our fellowship together, but It's actually not clear if this particular phrase about breaking bread explicitly refers to that. At the very least, it includes enjoying table fellowship as they dine together in one another's homes. It's noted in verse 46. But notice that the last part of verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. They devoted themselves to the prayers. It's a bit of an overly literal translation. Other English translations render it to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. Again, they're no longer waiting for the the gift of the Holy Spirit. They've received that. That's already happened. And yet, we we still find them devoting themselves to prayer. Why? Because that's what it means to be in relationship with God. A marriage in which there is never any conversation can hardly be described as a relationship, right? Right? There is no relationship without conversation. And prayer is our side of our conversation with God. Prayer is speaking to God, pouring out your heart before God, as Psalm 62, verse 8 commands us to do. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. 
about relationship. Or, or put differently, prayer is one of the chief expressions of our faith. Where there is faith, there will be prayer. Where there is no prayer, there is no faith. Every time we pray, we are, we are consciously giving expression to and exercising and strengthening our faith. We're giving expression to our belief that God exists, that He hears our prayers, that He is powerful enough to respond to our prayers, that He cares about us, that He cares enough to listen and to act, that He exists, that He hears, that He can act, that He cares. And also, not only that, Every time we pray, we are openly acknowledging our dependence upon Him. A life devoid of prayer is a self-reliant life. And a self-reliant life is necessarily devoid of spiritual peace and spiritual power. Every time we pray, we're exercising and growing both in faith and in humility. And this honors God. It glorifies Him when we pray. Prayer is therefore a prime act of worship. One of the main ways that we worship God and experience intimacy with God, enjoying our relationship with God, is through prayer. So, of course, these first Christians prayed, even after receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. They prayed. This prayer is about relationship and intimacy, faith and trust, dependence and humility, worship and joy. Now, we could easily have a multi-part sermon series on prayer. There's just so much to say about prayer in Scripture. But today, I, I want us to focus on, on the big picture, and especially on the place of prayer in the life of the Christian, as we see in these first few chapters of Acts. Devotedness to prayer is presented as an absolutely foundational for the Christian life, and thus as a top priority. It certainly was for these first Christians. And again, note the thrust of that passage in chapter 1 that describes their devotion to prayer. That passage contains the thematic verse of the entire book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, about the supernatural power they need to witness to others about Jesus to the end of the earth. Well, so too the thrust of this passage in chapter 2 that again describes their devotion to prayer is focused on the fruit of having received that supernatural power. The Christians begin to publicly witness to others about Jesus. In verse 41, there were added that day about 3,000 souls. These 3,000 joined with the 120 in devoting themselves to the word and prayer. In verse 47, what happens? The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The thrust of these two passages about prayer is mission. Note that it was the Lord who added to their number. Only God gives the growth. And so, we must pray. We must pray for the Lord to empower and embolden our faithfulness to live for Him. We must pray for the Lord to cause that faithfulness to lead to fruitfulness. That He would add to our number, day by day, those who are being saved. We must not expect Him to do for us what He did for them if we're not doing what they did. If we are not equally devoted to the Word and to prayer. The text goes on in chapter 3. Peter and James, they, they heal a lame beggar at one of the temple gates, which suddenly draws a huge crowd. And so Peter begins to publicly witness, preaching about repentance and faith in Christ. Another 2,000 people are saved on that day. Peter and John are therefore arrested by the religious authorities who feel threatened. The next day, Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin, the, the ones who were responsible for the execution of Jesus. And Peter, again, boldly preaches about repentance and faith in Christ to those wicked religious authorities. The Sanhedrin, out of fear of how the crowds might react if these two miracle workers were, were further punished, decide to release Peter and John. But they charge them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They threaten them about what will happen if they do. And so what do Peter and, and John do? They gather with their fellow believers for prayer. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Chapter 4, verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them, the threats. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. And then we have recorded the second recorded prayer of any Christians ever. 
The first recorded prayer is at the end of chapter 1, just before Pentecost, when the Christians were praying for God to appoint another apostle, thus making this, in chapter 4, the first recorded prayer following Pentecost, the first re recorded prayer of spirit-indwelt Christians. And like the first prayer recorded at the end of chapter 1, it's a corporate prayer, meaning that it's prayed aloud in the presence of the assembled congregation. What would that look like? Well, we're not told whether one person stood and prayed aloud on behalf of the assembly as the rest prayed silently in their hearts, as we so often do in, in our gathered worship on Sunday morning, such as the, the pastoral prayer. Or, or, or we're not told whether maybe they, they followed the, the common Jewish liturgical procedure where one person would pray a phrase at a time and the others would repeat that phrase, phrase by phrase, as, as we do at the children's moment. Or whether they took turns contributing to the prayer one by one. We, we, we simply don't know. We just know that they lifted their voices together to God. And as they lifted their voices together to God, they begin with these words, Sovereign Lord. They begin by acknowledging God's sovereign rule over all things. And they quote from Psalm 146, verse 6, which is part of our call to worship this morning. They say, Sovereign Lord, quote, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They're praying scripture, quoting God's words back to him. As an aside, if you find it hard to pray when you sit down to pray, Perhaps it's because you're not letting God start the conversation. Take time to listen to his word first and then respond to what he has said in prayer, allowing scripture to shape your prayer. It's a good example for us. We see it throughout scripture. But they pray, verse 25, Sovereign Lord, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, quoting Psalm chapter 2, Why did the Gentiles rage? the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. That psalm continues by saying that God laughs at those who set themselves against him and against his Christ. The prayer continues, verse 27. For truly in this city, in Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Think about that. These Christians are being threatened with, and, and many eventually will suffer, imprisonment, beatings, and even the same horrific death by crucifixion that Jesus suffered. And yet, they stop to acknowledge in prayer that God laughed at the attempts of the religious and governing authorities to silence Jesus by killing him. You see, by praying scripture, they are bolstering their faith that God is likewise laughing at the attempts of the same wicked authorities to silence them. For God will build his church. These evildoers are simply fulfilling the plan God had predestined to take place. And this knowledge gives them strength, and it motivates them to pray. For anyone who wrestles with the philosophical question of, of why we should make requests to God in prayer when he already knows both what we're going to pray and what he's going to do, notice that quandary did not hinder these Christians from praying. This prayer strongly affirms both God's sovereign decree of all things that take place, while at the same time affirming the importance and the efficacy of prayer. We don't need to understand how prayer works in order to pray. We simply need to trust that it works and pray. Having acknowledged God's sovereignty, they, they then make their request in verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. How interesting that they don't pray for the persecution to cease. They don't pray to otherwise be safely delivered from that persecution. But rather, they pray for the spiritual power to boldly endure the persecution. And for God to continue to bear witness to the truth of their message through miracles. Now, it's not to say that it's wrong to pray for, for trying circumstances to change. It's not, but it's instructive that their first focus is, 
is on their own faithfulness in the midst of those trials. That's their prayer. And it's instructive that these prayers are answered. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness in the face of threats. Don't you long for the Spirit to move in our midst as he did in theirs? That the Lord would so embolden us and so bless our labors that he would add to our number day by day those who are being saved. Well, if I had the time, I'd step through all the rest of the examples of gathered corporate prayer recorded in the book of Acts, as well as the numerous examples from the Old Testament. Maybe I'll include some of those in my newsletter article this week. Around 100 years ago, a Methodist pastor named Samuel Chadwick famously said, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. The longest passage on spiritual warfare in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul instructs us to put on the whole armor of God, that passage concludes with four references to prayer. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. As the gospel of salvation by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, spread like wildfire at the start of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, churches often held daily, morning and evening prayer services. Daily, morning and evening. It's well documented that the great revivals that the world has seen since that time have all been ignited by Christians committing themselves to gather weekly, if not daily, for prayer. This is certainly the case for what is now known as the First Great Awakening in Britain and the American colonies in the 1730s. And for the Second Great Awakening around 70 years later. And for the Third Great Awakening in the late 1850s. Quoting from scholar Joel Beek regarding that last one, the Third Great Awakening, he says this, Beginning in the fall of 1857, six men, just six men, gathered at noon every day for corporate prayer in the room of a Reformed church in New York City. That was in the fall. By early 1858, more than 20 prayer groups were meeting at noon in New York City. In Chicago, more than 2,000 people gathered daily for prayer at the Metropolitan Theater. The prayer movement spread to nearly all the major cities of America, then made its way to the British Isles and around the world. Prayer meetings sprang up everywhere, in churches, on college campuses, in hospitals, among sailors, on mission fields, and at orphanages and colleges. Scholars estimate that two million or more were converted in the revivals of the late 1850s, while hundreds of thousands of professing Christians were deeply affected. And then shortly after that revival in the 1860s, Charles Spurgeon organized prayer meetings at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. People met at 7 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. every day, 365 days a year, twice a day. More than 3,000 came to the meeting every Monday evening. Can you imagine a regular prayer meeting of 3,000 strong? Charles Spurgeon said this in one of those prayer meetings. How could we expect a blessing from God if we are too idle to ask for it? How could we look for a Pentecost if we never met with one accord in one place to wait upon the Lord? Brethren, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general, till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. You will never become a praying person until you resolve to be a praying person. And we will never be a praying church until we resolve to be a praying church. So I'm asking you to resolve to make prayer a priority this year. Lord willing, six weeks from today, on Sunday, March 6th at 4.30 p.m., we will gather for the first of our weekly Sunday evening gatherings. These Sunday evening gatherings should be no more than an hour in length. We'll begin by singing a song or two, and then we'll have 10 to 20 minutes of sharing. 
where I, I'll, I'll call on people who I've already spoken with in advance to, to briefly share about some discipleship or outreach activity that they're involved in, whether in association with one of the committees of our church or, or better yet, something they're engaged in on their own, in their neighborhood, in, in their workplace, in their, their circle of friends and family, in, in their social clubs or, or hobby groups. Not only is this a chance for us to come alongside one another in praying for these, these kingdom activities, it's a chance to invite others to, to come help participate in these activities where appropriate. It's also a chance to hear about new ideas of activities that, that you could implement in your own spheres of influence. During this 10 to 20 minutes of sharing, but before I call on a person to share, I'll get someone else to volunteer to pray for what is about to be shared during our time of prayer. That's the next 15 to 20 minutes or so. Those who have volunteered to pray for something that was shared will, will take turns to, to offer brief one to two minute prayers as we all join along in our hearts. And then following that, we'll have 10 to 20 minutes of teaching of some kind. Sometimes it'll be a brief devotional on some passage of scripture, possibly related to the sermon text from that morning. Sometimes it might just be further teaching on the sermon text. There's far more I could say about prayer today. Other times it might be teaching on a topic that has come up that needs to be addressed, but that really doesn't work very well in a Sunday morning sermon. Other times it will be training and discussion on things like personal evangelism and prayer. And then time permitting, we'll close by lifting our voices together once more in song. About an hour every Sunday evening. So mark it on your calendars now. Sunday, March 6th at 4.30 p.m., and weekly thereafter. And begin now, in the next six weeks leading up to that, to pray for the Lord to bless these evening gatherings. As the old saying goes, a family that prays together stays together. Well, so too, a church that prays together stays together. And a church that does not pray together should not expect to stay together. They should not expect their lampstand to remain lit they should not expect the Lord to bless their ministry labors. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Only God gives the growth. So let us with one accord devote ourselves to seeking him in prayer. Let us pray. Father, in this moment, we humbly acknowledge our dependence upon you for all things. We confess and we repent of any prayerless self-reliance and of any loveless indifference toward the plight of those who do not know you around us. By the Holy Spirit that you have given to us, as you gave to the first Christians at Pentecost, grant us the resolve to be a praying church, that we may each individually grow spiritually to face the difficulties of life in a broken world and to live for you. And as a church, that we may grow in our impact upon this world. Bless the preaching of your word. In and for the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.